The capital asset pricing model, or the CAPM, is a foundational model in finance, and it's critical um, for developing our understanding of risk and expected return. In this video, I'll talk a little bit about the intuition behind the CAPM, and ultimately I'll give you a nice concise equation that you can use to estimate the discount rate for valuing a stock. So when thinking about what a discount rate should be, uh, let's, let's start by backing up just a bit and, and recalling that uh, the price of a stock should be the present value of all expected future dividends. Now in any present value calculation, you really need two things. You need cash flows, and so here it's expected future dividends, and you need a discount rate. Discount rate is what we're working on today. And so in stock valuation, you'll see the present value formula take a number of forms. One is a, is a very basic uh, constant growth dividend model. Uh, recall the formula looks like this. Price is equal to the first dividend divided by R minus G. So R in this formula is the discount rate. And that's what we're, we're, we're trying to develop here in this video. And so just as a backdrop, let's remember a, a few things. First, investors are risk averse. Risk averse investors dislike risk. And all that means is they require compensation for bearing risk in the form of a higher expected return. And so the discount rate that we're trying to develop needs to contain a premium to reflect the stock's risk. So riskier stocks should have higher discount rates than less risky stocks. Next thing that we need to remember is that anyone can build a diversified portfolio. So recall that individual stocks are subject to both systematic risk and idiosyncratic risk, but when you put stocks together in a portfolio, the idiosyncratic risk of each is diversified away and all you're left with is systematic risk. And so when investors can easily build such diversified portfolios, um, it's really systematic risk that is important to us. And so when we're developing the discount rate, we need to hone in on systematic risk. Let's start the discussion with a fully diversified portfolio. We're going to call this portfolio the market portfolio, or I may also say the stock market or simply the market for short. Now theoretically, this portfolio is comprised of all risky assets everywhere. Now in terms of actually observing data, that's a really tough nut to crack. So we're going to have to approximate the market by using a stock market index. So for example, the S&P 500. Now we know a few things about the stock market. Obviously it has good days and it has bad days. Now for our purposes, we're going to um, characterize its degree of goodness simply by its return on that particular day. A positive 10% return is good, a negative 10% return is bad, a positive 10% return is a better day than a positive 2% return, and a negative 10% return is a worse day than a negative 2% return. So I think you get the point here. And since this market portfolio is fully diversified, these varying returns that we're talking about on good and bad days are driven solely by systematic risk. Now, for normalization, and as really a, a, a starting point as, as we move into individual stocks, we're going to say that the market portfolio has exactly one unit of systematic risk. Okay, so when we think of the stock market then, think systematic risk equals one. So systematic risk of two would be more risk than the market, and systematic risk of 0.5 would be less risk than the market. And finally, 
the market's risk premium, so the market risk premium, is going to be the extra expected return investors receive for bearing exactly one unit of systematic risk. That is the extra expected return investors receive for holding the market portfolio. And we can write this market risk premium as the expected return for portfolio M, so the expected return for the market, minus the risk-free rate. Now, I want to remind you of why the stock market pays this premium. So we know that some days the stock market's going to yield higher returns than T-bills. The T-bills are going to be the risk-free asset. On other days, it's going to yield lower returns than T-bills. Since investors don't like this variation in outcome, that is, since investors are risk averse, they will only buy stocks if the stock market on average pays a higher return than T-bills. So again, the difference between the expected return on the stock market and that on T-bills is greater than zero. So the stock market pays a positive risk premium. Now back to our objective of determining an appropriate discount rate for valuing an individual stock. Since only systematic risk needs to matter, the cap M is going to connect the market portfolio where only systematic risk exists. So it's going to connect the market portfolio to individual stocks. So thinking about individual stocks, recall that individual stock returns are driven by both systematic risk and idiosyncratic risk. And so when I say the cap M is going to connect to the market portfolio to individual stocks, what ultimately we're going to do is separate out the systematic component since idiosyncratic risk doesn't affect a diversified investor. And in the cap M, we have a nice simple measure of a stock's systematic risk. And that's just going to be the sensitivity of a stock's return to the return on the market portfolio. We call this sensitivity the stock's beta. So in the cap M, beta is the measure of systematic risk. So what does beta look like? Well, as I said before, beta is going to be a stock's sensitivity to the market portfolio. Here's a chart we looked at in a previous video where we have the S&P 500 or the market portfolio. in blue and Nike in green and Facebook in red. Nike's beta indicates Nike's sensitivity to the returns of the S&P 500. That is, what happens to Nike when the S&P 500 moves in one direction or another. So in that sense, Nike's beta captures the extent to which Nike's price movements are explained by the overall stock market. That is, Nike's beta captures movements in Nike due to systematic sources. By looking at this picture, we can tell that Nike's beta is positive. This is true because when the market moves up, Nike tends to move up. When the market moves down, Nike tends to move down as well. Same can be said for Facebook. And 
for that matter, just about every asset that exists is going to have a positive beta. Now let's think about some specific values for beta. Starting with the base case where beta is equal to 1, this simply means that when the market is up, the stock is up by about the same amount. When the market is down, the market is down by about the same amount. And so put another way, the stock and the market sort of move one to one with each other on average. In this case, we would say that the stock has a similar systematic risk as the market. And as such, it should have the same expected return. As the market. Second case, beta is greater than one. So this means that the price movements are more extreme. than the markets. So if the market's up 5%, the stock might be up 6%. The market's down 5%, the stock might be down 6%. So here we have greater systematic risk than the market. And since the stock has greater systematic risk than the market, it should have a greater expected return. And then finally, our low risk case where beta is less than one but still positive. Here, stock returns are going to be less extreme than the market. So if the market is up 5%, the stock might be up 4%. And the stock, if, if, if the market is down 5%, the stock might be down 4%. So here we would say that the stock has less systematic risk than the market. And and as such, it should have a lower expected return than the market. More formally, the capital asset pricing model simply says an asset's risk premium is proportional to its beta. And so for notation purposes, I'm going to use I as a subscript to reference an individual asset or an individual stock, and I'll use M To reference the market. And so when we say an asset's risk premium is proportional to its beta, algebraically, we could write it like this. The expected return of asset I minus the risk-free rate, so that is the stock's risk premium is equal to its beta times the market risk premium. Okay, so beta I is the stock's beta this term in brackets 
is the market risk premium. Now we could also write this in the following way. We could just rearrange slightly and say the expected return or the discount rate for an individual stock is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. And so we can go back to these values here and simply insert them into the formula that I just wrote. And so and so the numbers one or something greater than one or something less than one would go in here for beta. And so if beta equals one, what happens when beta equals one? You'll see that this value here becomes one and the expected return for the stock becomes the expected return for the stock market. That is the stock in the stock market have the same expected return. If beta is greater than one, then the expected return for the stock ends up being greater than the expected return for the market. And if beta is less than one, the expected return for the stock becomes less than the expected return for the market. Now, one final thing that I'd like to say about the CAPM for now, um, we have this equation which tells us what the discount rate should be for an individual stock. We can plot this with expected return of the stock on the y-axis and the stock's beta on the x-axis. And In this plot we'll have a couple of specific points. So we'll have one here and the expected return of the market here. And then we can put the risk-free rate right here. And so if we plot this equation in this space, we'll have a straight line that goes from the risk-free rate through one and upward and to the right. We call this line the security market line. The security market line simply tells us about the relationship between a stock's expected return and its beta. So a high beta stock might be out here. You'll see that it's got an expected return that's higher than the market. A low beta stock is going to be somewhere over here. You'll see that it has an expected return that is lower than the market.